Hello and welcome to Coinscast, Scotland's feminist arts podcast. My name is Hannah Labrie. And I am Caitlin Skinner. And welcome to this, the fourth and final full episode in our second series of Coinscast. Today, the theme is education. On each episode, we invite some of Scotland's leading feminist writers, poets, playwrights and musicians to respond to our theme. Today, we'll be hearing from musician Emma Pollock, crime writer Val McDermott, poet Angie Strachan, and also be hearing a short play written and performed by Nellie Kelly. Quine's cast is brought to you by feminist theatre company Stella Quine's in association with the Travis Theatre. And the word Quine's, if you don't know already, is a Scottish word for women. Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here. This is our last full episode in the current series of Quine's Cast. Hannah, I can't believe we've come to the end already. It feels too soon. But happily, we have an excellent end of term episode for you as we look at the theme of education. We'll be looking at our education system, maybe what a feminist approach to education might look like, our experiences of school, and also, I guess, looking at learning more broadly. How do we relate to the idea of learning throughout our lives? Hannah, I know you to have been a former teacher. Sometimes maybe in your friendship, I feel maybe a little teacherliness slips out now and again, but maybe I need that sometimes. I think that's fair enough. But does that experience, has that informed why we've chosen this theme today, do you think? I feel like we need to have a chat about that later. <laughs> Teacherly experience. See me after. Yeah, I'm going to write that in your notes. Do you know what? I think this season and last season has been such an education for me. I've learned so much. And I think it got us thinking about how many opportunities do we get to learn together and what is our system, is our institutions, are they fit for purpose? Are they serving us? And, and you know, and, and what is a feminist education you know, system? What does that look like? What is a feminist approach? And, you know, this theme felt really rich and, I don't know, really important to where we are, I suppose. I don't know, what do you think, Kate? Yeah, of course. Obviously, like um, education for us is a system and that is a system created within a patriarchy. So from a feminist point of view, like it's likely to be created, I guess, with um, maybe a male bias or a, and therefore it, does that mean that's a place where we experience more sexism, more marginalisation than we need to? And maybe today is like an opportunity to imagine what something different might be what the possibilities might be for um, an education system or systems that are better for women and non-binary people and people of other marginalized genders yeah absolutely and are they safe you know we talk a lot about active anti-racism and the content of our curriculum and I think there's a lot of work to make it more inclusive more intersectional more feminist so yeah absolutely I mean our education system and education in the way you know traditionally it's always been there to serve those in power I suppose and maybe people could challenge me on that but that definitely feels that that's the kind of purpose of it isn't it but yeah we are gonna welcome some wonderful guests for you in this episode but to start with we have the wonderful Emma Pollock. Emma is a Scottish singer-songwriter musician um, absolute legend for me, education is about curiosity, and curiosity is something that never leaves you, hopefully, and leads you to doing a lot of exciting things. And So school for me, I actually really loved it because it actually gave me a thing to do. I wasn't always the quickest witted in the playground, and I just kind of didn't understand what a lot of the kids, were, the girls were talking about. It was weird sometimes, the dynamic in a playground. We all know that. It can be very difficult. It can be very hard to kind of work out the cliques and the what are you meant to do to be popular and and when you don't work that out I just decided to just have a go at maths instead so it's, it's not all bad school's not all bad it just depends on what it is you want out of it Every day is hell bad on delivering fresh heaven sand My focus disappears, my mind inhales hypotheses Rocks and thieves, you know, they masquerade as new ideas And when the thunder peals, 
the damage done becomes revealed Can only move by standing still Forget the views beyond the hill You've got this upside down So pour it out Don't like to say hello But love if you might help me make it so But just revel in a deconstruction You've got lots to talk about But I prefer to walk about Give the moment center stage Before I turn another page Can only move by standing Upside down, so pour it out. Too many numbers and not enough poetry. I let them fight to the death, but will they be the death? The death of me. The doors we leave ajar just let the breeze in from afar. Reminds me of the dalliance that I enjoy with second chances My legs still perceive but willing thoughts while well, they just bury me Cause every day is new you see and grows another branch on my future tree Can only move by standing still Forget the views beyond Upside down, so pour it out. Can only move by standing still. Forget the views beyond the hill. You got this upside down. Too many numbers. But will they be the death? The death of me. That was the wonderful Emma Pollock, and we will have more from Emma to close our show. Now for the reflection. Caitlin, tell us who is responding today. Oh, it's very exciting. We have none other than the queen of crime herself, Val McDermott. Val is a number one bestseller. Her work is translated into more than 40 languages, and she's won loads of awards. And I think one of my favourite facts from her bio is that she has six honorary doctorates. I mean, amazing. Can't think of anyone better to talk about this theme, really. Delighted to have her on the podcast. Here is Val. Today's text is taken from a truly stellar quine, one who grew up not far from here on the far side of Bruntsfield Lynx. In her most famous novel, The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie, Muriel Spark puts these words in the mouth of Miss Brodie herself. The word education comes from the root E from X, out, and duco, I lead. It means a leading out. To me, education is a leading out of what is already there in the pupil's soul. Now, Jean Brodie was a woman in her prime, and in this respect, at least, she knew what she was talking about. This week, I've been at Oxford, being garlanded with an honorary doctorate from the university where I took my undergraduate degree almost 50 years ago. I know it's hard to believe, but... (laughs) I grew up in a working-class household in Fife, part of the first generation in my family to go to university, at a time when our fees were paid for us, and we also got a grant to pay for our upkeep. Fancy that, eh? I went to Kirkcaldy High School, which prided itself on solid academic achievement, backed up with a mind-boggling range of extracurricular activities led by teachers. It was a grounding that has led me to a successful and rewarding career. The main reason for that was that I was exposed to a level of education that was geared to the world I was emerging into. It made early decisions about who were the sheep and who were the goats, but the goats weren't written off. They were mostly steered into channels that suited what was already there in their souls. Now, I'm not going to go off on a rant about how that was the golden age where everything in the garden was lovely. 
One of the main problems with the education of our children, though, is that too many of the crucial decisions are influenced by people like me, who learned that rec reciting the seven times table till you could do it in your sleep was the way to get ahead. We still need to educate our children and equip them for fruitful lives, but the world of work they're emerging into is different in almost every respect from the one I contemplated when I graduated in 1975. How do we educate the next generation to survive a world we have only a tangential understanding of? How do we equip them for success when success is measured in how many people watch your TikTok video? I'm no dancing, by the way. <laughs> how in the name of God do you monetize your Insta? I mean, do you, do you even have an Instagram account? Albert Einstein, a man who was by all accounts a bit of a dunce at school, once said, it's nothing short of a miracle that modern methods of instruction have not yet entirely strangled the holy curiosity of inquiry. Which brings me to what I want to say about education. We need a complete rethink, an educational programme that meets the requirements of the times we live in, that sends our children out into the world with inquiring minds, to explore and tunnel down into information that means something to them. We need to help them ignite the passion that will light a fire inside that will burn for the rest of their lives. So how do we do that? Well, I have one concrete su suggestion. When I was at school, we had a history teacher whose classes were essentially lectures. He would pace back and forth, his voice a monotonous drone, delivering fact-laden accounts of events that were almost exclusively English history. <laughs> I genuinely used to fall asleep in his classes. I know now that some of the things he spoke about were major events that changed the future of our country, or indeed the world. But his presentation was frankly terrible. I've no doubt he knew his stuff, but he didn't have a clue how to impart it. He put me off history for years until I encountered storytellers, writers and scholars who were in love with their subject and knew how to make it come to life. There's been a lot of research into the power of stories. We know people retain information that comes as a narrative far more clearly than a recitation of facts. We know that researchers attempting to change behaviours have more success when the persuasion comes wrapped in a story rather than a set of instructions. If we want an educated population, I think we should be training our teachers to entertain as much as they inform. That would be the springboard for children making their own explanations. Because I believe the fundamental point of education is to help us think for ourselves. Einstein again, education is not the learning of facts but training the mind to think. People often ask me what I learned at Oxford. They expect me to hold forth about the significance of Shakespeare or the meaning of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Not a bit of it. What I learned there was how to think for myself, where to find what I needed to know. Facts are great for pub quizzes, but they don't teach us how to navigate the world. Curiosity is what does that. It's not elitist to say that the most important quality we can encourage in children is curiosity. You don't have to be top of the class to wonder, to dream, to imagine. Even children whose home environment has dulled their senses and stunted their wonder at the world have questions. And the function of education is to help them find answers, ideally the sort of answers that lead to more questions. In so many ways, the road to fostering curiosity is much easier to travel for kids today. For me, it was the local library where I led, read my way around the shelves of the children's section. That's how I became a writer. I love the Shally School books. And in one of those books, one of the characters who grows up to be a writer gets a letter from her publisher. And in that letter, there was a check. <laughs> and, and it was like an absolute epiphany. People get paid for doing this. I'm going to be a writer. I can tell lies. <laughs> and, and the other thing it taught me was, was how to put things together. Because the Shally School books, there were about 50 odd of them. But because it was the library, you could never read them in order. You just could read the next one that was on the shelves. So it was like this just giant 3D jigsaw puzzle in my head. And every now and again, you'd read, a, read something in one of the books that explained something you'd been reading about for years and never understood why it happened. He's like, that's why she's like she is. So it trained me in lots of ways to, to get out into the world and tell stories and hear stories. And now with access to tablets and computers and smartphones and multiple TV channels, the world can open up in a way we could only dream of. Of course there are potholes in the information superhighway, diversions that lead unformed minds into dangerous places. But one of our responsibilities as adults is to make that environment safe for them, to hold the Elon Musks and the Mark Zuckerbergs to account, but also to steer kids to the safe places. To the, th to the things that will captivate them and make them want more of the good stuff. 
At the heart of this are their teachers. I'd like to think the last word in that sentence would be parents, but too often it's not. Parents abdicate the business of fostering curiosity and independent thinking for all sorts of reasons. Sometimes it's because they never had that care themselves, so they never learned its importance or how to do it. Sometimes it's because they're working so hard to keep a roof over their heads and food on the table that they just haven't got the time or the energy, and it's just one more thing to feel guilty about. And sometimes they just can't be bothered. But the teachers have to be bothered. Einstein got it right again. It is the supreme art of the teacher to awaken joy and creative expression and knowledge. So many of us can point to inspirational teachers who listened to us, who encouraged us, who gave us the courage to dream big. I know I did. In many countries, teaching is one of the most highly regarded professions, and the rewards are in proportion to that. Their teachers don't have to take second jobs to pay their bills. They're not swamped with admin and paperwork that eats into their evenings and their weekends. They have time for engaging with music and sport and games. They're not so exhausted they can't lead their children out into the world of possibilities. Remember Muriel Spark, the word education comes from the root E from X, out and duco, I lead. It means a leading out. To me, education is a leading out of what is already there in the pupil's soul. This probably sounds like an impossible dream, but there are some countries in the world that dare to be different, where the cry of education, education, education isn't just an electioneering slogan, but an absolute commitment. I want my country to be like that. Isn't it about time we started to make it happen? Okay, the wonderful Val McDermott giving us her reflection in education. I think that was had a lot there to offer us about how we think about how our education system is fit for purpose and, and how we move forward with that. You know, as somebody who left school at 16, I think I found school very difficult. And I think I found that idea about being being classed or seen as a certain type of learner or having a certain type of future quite damaging and difficult. And it took me a long time to get back into education. And I think as a teacher... I definitely felt that edu our education system was not a system that was fit for purpose, that was fair. I think I found it, you know, it's institutionally racist, it's um, deeply elitist. It doesn't, I don't think, it, um, allow people to thrive or to um, find their curiosity, both as students and as uh, teachers. And I love that idea about giving teachers the time to continue to be passionate and to continue to be learners. I think that's something we don't value enough. What did you think of that, Caitlin? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, she's calling there for a complete rethink and like it does need that. Like we think about schools and schooling was set up for a completely different world with a completely different set of values and needs. We need revolution, not reform, right? Like it needs to, it's like so many people, as you say, are being failed by what should be their, their right. That should be your right to an education. The system isn't serving so many folks. There must be a better way to think of it. And that idea, as you say, about lighting a fire in teachers and in students that can last a lifetime. I think it's a really powerful set of ideas, actually. Yeah, and I think, actually, I love that idea about having, the, like, you know, what is the goal of education? I think that's a question we don't ask ourselves enough or examine enough. And, like, oh. you know, is the goal about creating a, you know, a, a, a workforce? Or is it about creating critical thinkers? I mean, what is it that we value in education? And I, you know, I think the idea of valuing stories and the narrative and the art subjects under such threat. Yeah, there's so much, I think, that was said by Val that I think feels really vital to these discussions that we're actually having at the moment about what our education system is going to be looking like. There's you know, a lot of proposals for a big, huge overhaul. And I really hope that voices like Val's get, you know, valued at that, as well as, you know, voices from many people who are not served by our education system at the moment. Yeah, so uh, it feels like this is a good opportunity to introduce our discussion group, yeah? Exactly. So um, we're welcoming back for the final time this season the house band or the discussion group. They're a very special group of women and they're having their say on education from a feminist point of view. Yeah, and you will hear clips from them throughout this episode. They are Lisa George, Clementine Burnley, Carrie Lunin, B. Asha, Zandra Yeaman and Azim Rebecca Assel and their conversation as always, was beautifully captured by our editor, Helena Mihai. What I would have loved is, I wish my school really put a lot of importance in language, yeah. languages, because, you know, we don't really, like, we get, you know, secondary school 
level French or, or and it's always European languages as well I might add um, but there was never any scope for other languages and even when you think about the languages that are spoken in Scotland today we were speaking earlier about even Punjabi or mm. Urdu you know they, they don't think like that and I wish languages had been something because communication is something that keeps us all connected mm. I think the things that were to prepare us for our grown up world I don't think we necessarily get that in our education system and I think that's quite sad I, I would love it if uh, we, we were taught how to keep ourselves well <laughs> and it's in the widest sense you know keep ourselves mentally well keep ourselves physically well what does that actually mean mm-hmm. um, they are starting to do that now though like, yeah I mean it's a long time since I was in school yeah. it certainly wasn't something that we were taught around you know what does what does mental wellness look like mm-hmm. Um, how do you, you know, how do you make best use of the health system as it is, and um, but all the stuff around, um, you know, respect for your body, respect for other people's bodies. What does consent mean? That's maybe all much more part of the curriculum now. What do boundaries mean? But also, I think to the sort of things that I've come to only be educated in later life around, like bystander training. I mean, that feels like it should be at school. You know, how, how do you recognise um, when things are being said that are microaggressions and what how, how do you get language that you feel comfortable with to call it out? How do you change a culture around it? All of that stuff feels really important. But it's really difficult, isn't it? Because the, there's things that happen in, in people's home lives yeah. and then they're put into this school setting where there's a particular expectation on respect or, you know, language or any of these things. But then in their home life, it's a completely flip. It's a completely different thing. And so I think it's, it's um, yeah, I, I don't know what the answer is there because I think that's a really difficult one. And again, if we're expecting the education system to do everything, we're, we're not going to get that right. Okay, that was a wonderful discussion group. And every time I listen to them speak, I... Um, challenged and and think differently and and I do think that we often sort of expect our education system to do everything and I wonder again what is it that we want education to do what is it for and I feel like that feels like a really important question and you know is it about curiosity or is it about fixing everything and yeah and as Sandra said I don't think that is what we can ask, or that's too much of an ask. Okay, so every episode of Quine's Cast, we commission a short play inspired by our theme. So I'm going to let Caitlin tell us a little bit about the play that we have for you. Yeah, we have a very funny and poignant short piece from the excellent Nellie Kelly this week. Nellie is a playwright, theatre maker and drag performer. They are an autistic and trans non-binary artist and advocate who aims to make work that resists traditional theatre structures that create barriers to access for artists and audiences. They are doing very cool things. This play is called Little Autistic Girl, Young Autistic Woman, and it's performed by Nelly themselves, alongside actor Brooke Walker. Spit it out. Spit what out? What you have to say for yourself. How can I spit out what I have to say? Speak. Tell me why you are here. I said fuck. <laughs> This is my head teacher, and frankly, I think she's a moron. <laughs> I'm 11 years old. I'm standing in front of her desk in her office trying to seem uh, demure. Not because I want to, just because I think it might get me in a little less trouble. Don't ask me why it's going to get me in less trouble. I have no idea. I just know that's how it works. She's sitting behind her desk in one of those big fancy chairs, like a big fancy executive chair. The kind that tells all the wains that she exerts her power over that it is her, not us, who calls the fucking shots around here. She sits there, hands clasped, leaning over her desk towards me with some sort of faux sympathetic look on her coupon. The sort that says, you're just not getting it, are you? And in some ways she's right. I'm completely lost in this whole situation. But in other ways, in that moment, when I lift my head just enough to stare at her across the table and savour the way the word fuck feels on my 11-year-old tongue. I think maybe I get it more than she ever has in her entire big stupid adult life. Is that really any way for a little girl to behave? I'm not little. I'm almost 11. Well, you're certainly behaving like a little girl. 
But you just said I wasn't. What I mean is it wasn't very ladylike of you, was it? I'm not a lady either. You're supposed to be a young lady, not that you're behaving like one. But you just said I was a little girl. Little girls grow into young ladies. Not that your behaviour is becoming of a little girl or a young lady. But if I am a little girl or a young lady, then surely any way I behave is the behaviour of a little girl or a young lady. Listen, girl. The word girl comes out of her mouth in a way that makes me think this must be the way you spit words out of your mouth. Listen closely. How do you even listen closely? Enough! You're being difficult on purpose. I've been told that my whole life. That I'm difficult, that I mean to be difficult. I don't, but especially at this age, admitting that feels too vulnerable. So I wear my difficult nature like a suit of armour and channel it into a dramatic scuff of my shoe on the carpet and letting out a long, exacerbated sigh. I said enough! The only problem is... My suit of armour at this point is made of something like really shit and useless, like uh, jelly. It's like a jelly suit of armour. It's there, but it's not very effective, and it's May, and it's like actually warm outside. And who wants a jelly suit of armour any time of year, but especially not in like the one week of sun that we actually get in Scotland? And the jelly suit is hot and sticky and melting away to nothing, and I'm just trying to scoop it all back up so I have at least some sort of protection from our ridiculous nonsense words and the like 50 millionth time an adult has called me difficult just for trying to make sense of what they're even saying. Not actually the 50 millionth time. That means like a lot of times. That, that's what you say when uh, you mean that something's happened a lot of times. I think. Oh, come on now. I didn't mean to shout. It's okay. There's no need to cry. I'm not crying. It's okay to cry sometimes. I am not crying. I know you're upset, but I won't accept you shouting at me. You shouted at me first. Yes, well, I'm the adult here and I apologised for shouting at you. No, you didn't. I did. Didn't. I'm not going to argue with you. You said you didn't mean to shout. You didn't say sorry. Why do you act like this? I've said I'm not here to argue with you. Not everything needs to be a fight, Miss Kelly. Something feels kind of gross when she calls me Miss Kelly. I, I don't actually really know why right now. But what I do know, looking back, is that maybe if either of us had any idea that at this point I was one of the 80% of girls under 18 uh, missed for an autism diagnosis, then maybe I, she, we might actually know how to handle this situation a little better. This clearly isn't fun for you either. Don't you think your life would be much happier if everything didn't have to be a fight? We don't want that, and I don't think you do either. I want to tell her that of course I don't want that. That of course I want my life to be happier. But if nothing else, the little I do feel like I understand by this point is that everything most certainly does need to be a fight. You're a smart girl, Miss Kelly, but there is a difference between being smart and being wise. Is there? We both know that you are smart, but I think we both know you aren't making smart choices, and that's what really makes a smart person wise. If you cut the attitude you have and apply that energy to your schoolwork, think of all the things you could achieve in school and in life. You're going to the big school after summer. It's time to wise up and start making smart choices. If you focus on what's really important and applied yourself to your studies, you could go on to do anything with your life. If I've heard that I'm difficult 50 million times by this point in my 11 years of life, then I've heard that I'm smart, but I just need to work harder 50 billion times. Which is funny and less of a ha-ha sort of way and more of a like not actually really funny at all way. The harder I try to work, the more I seem to get in trouble, and the more that grown-ups think that I'm not actually trying hard at all. This might surprise you to hear, but when I was your age, I was like you. <laughs> I was. When I was younger, I was just as strong-willed, just as wild-hearted. What happened? <laughs> I'll try not to take that as an insult. What happened was I realised it gets you nowhere in life. And you, well, you could really go somewhere. 
Where? Well, whatever you want. If you can just learn to toe the line. Toe the line? Behave. If you can just learn how to behave and learn how to be considerate and kind to others. I am considerate and kind to others. I gave half my sandwich to Sam at lunch and I helped Rogan with her spelling. Well, swearing at a teacher isn't very kind or considerate, is it? I said it nicely. You can't say the F word nicely. Yes, you can. For For goodness sake, Miss Kelly, will you just listen? For once in your life, just listen. Thank you. You can't say the F word nicely, no matter how nicely you say it, because the F word isn't a nice word, no matter how nicely you say it. Does that make sense? No. It's about respect. You as a child are required to respect your teacher and respect includes things like not saying the F word to them. But I wasn't even saying it to Mrs Murdoch. I was saying it to Brogan and Mrs Murdoch asked me what I said to Brogan like you asked me what I said to Mrs Murdoch. Well, the fact of the matter is you shouldn't have been saying it at all. But... (sighs) If you hadn't have said it in the first place, a word you definitely shouldn't be sharing with other young ladies then you wouldn't have gotten into trouble by saying it to Mrs Murdoch, would you? No. And Mrs Murdoch deserves your kindness and compassion in the same way that Brogan and Sam do, right? But Brogan and Sam are nice to me. Mrs Murdoch is your teacher. It's not her job to be nice to you. It's her job to keep you and all the other children safe. And she'd be much nicer to you if you respected her. If you respected her, she would respect you. Respect isn't something that's given. It's something that's earned. Then why doesn't Miss Murdoch earn my respect? She doesn't have to. She's your teacher. But you just said... You are a child. She is an adult. And an adult in position of authority who is responsible for your well-being and for your behaviour to her and to the other children in the class. Do you understand? Yes. I don't really understand. But I do understand that I'd like to not be in trouble anymore. So I just say I understand. Good. I'm glad we've made some progress here today. Look, I know it's a lot to wrap your head around. But I also know that deep down, you're a great kid. Yeah? Yes. But I want the world to be able to see how great you can be. I want Mrs Murdoch, all the teachers and children, and those you'll meet at secondary school to see that too. I want them to see a wise young lady making smart choices, ready to succeed in life. Don't you? So, do you have anything to say for yourself? I've been in this spot enough times to know that when she asks that, what she actually means is she wants me to say sorry. So, I try to give her the words so that we can just be done with it, but... My mouth feels dry and my brain doesn't have the words left because it's using all its power to stand in front of her desk and act like she wants me to. And the more I try to latch on to the word sorry, the more my brain feels like itchy, like actually itchy, or maybe more burny. No, itchy and burny at the same time. (coughs) My brain is helpfully now shouting at me about how much I actually couldn't be less sorry and how much I hate her and her weird air conditioning which is the only noise I can hear right now while everything else around me feels too hot and itchy and burny and wrong. Come on now Miss Kelly, we haven't got all day. What do you have to say for yourself? My skin feels like it's on fire by now but I use every ounce of focus I can to search one last time for the bit of my brain that has the words and... I managed to still myself. Like actually relax and then I feel really proud that I've managed to catch myself that never happens so I look up at her proudly open my mouth and give her the word that my brain has managed to find what do you have to say fuck I know that there were times when the only way I survived in school was knowing that it would be over eventually. And I've never been in a job that I thought I couldn't escape just by quitting. But I think kids can't get out of school. So I think it has to be built around their needs. It's a bit hard when you've got 24 kids or you've got 33 kids and 
you have the limited training that you have and you have the resources that you have. And these kids have really specific needs. It's really difficult to do individualized um, teaching. So what you end up with is crowd control. Um, and I think teachers get very, very stressed and they're modeling sometimes behaviors which are really not relational. All of the schools that I've been in touch with need more resources. All the schools that were the best resourced were the really nicest schools for people to, to learn in. I think what you say is spot on. Like, class sizes are too big. You know, the, the way that our society doesn't resource our um, environments that we're putting children in is unbelievable. It's like, it's like the world's topsy-turvy, isn't it? My daughter was telling me that her, in her school, the some of the teachers make them set boy-girl. And she's like, what's that about in this day and age? And that makes the non-binary people in their class feel really uncomfortable. But it also makes me feel really uncomfortable because I have to sit next to some boy that I don't really get on with. And she, she, yeah, she's right. She's saying they're using us, the girls, or the people that are more settled as a way of controlling the behaviour of the people they can't manage. Oh, that was exactly the same 15 years ago when I was at school. And that was, that was like the rationale behind it then was the pack of boys together. It's too much. Girls are sensible. And yeah. So it's up, to, it's up to girls, not just so their learning's impacted by having to keep the boys calm. I really enjoy all the teacherly cliches that come out from the head teacher character in that play and how, yeah, in a time of crisis with a real lack of resources and other ways of doing things she's leaning in to all of those things including a really gendered approach to teaching someone and like those expectations around gender um are really prevalent in school and the discussion group reflecting on that as well yeah as our I think that play is just a, a brilliant reflection on that kind of experience and what it's like to be in a system that's not able to serve you and not knowing how to ask for what you need either um, and how do we better equip ourselves to support each other and to teach individuals who have a range of experiences and ways of being in the world? Yeah, absolutely. It was a really nuanced play and I definitely think it speaks to, you know, as you said, the discussion group is really speaking to the idea of what happens in an under-resourced system, which is, you know, often um, a sort of, you know, it becomes about control, doesn't it? And crowd control and, and um, yeah, and those ideas about, the girls being the good girls and they behave and expectation they behave in a certain way. Both the discussion group and that play were just were really, I think, powerful. Yeah, it feels like we are now at the point where we're going to introduce our next guest, the wonderful poet Angie Strachan. Angie Strachan is a regular performer in the Scottish spoken word scene and she is the current Scottish poetry slam champion. So yeah, sit back and relax. Hi, um, I would like to think that I'm an eternal opsimath. Now, please don't ask me what the full definition of that means, but it's something to do with someone go going to education later on in life. Um, my mum uh, went to study for a degree in business when she was in her 50s. And um, I kind of took the path where I wanted to sing and dance with the kids from fame when I was 15. But my mum told me that that was not a proper job, so I went to learn to type instead. Um, but it wasn't until um, recently when I started to study towards a creative writing and English literature degree with the Open University and uh, doing that part time. And that's really opened doors for me. Um, so now I've kind of gone from wanting to sing and dance with the kids from fame to wanting to be a performance poet. So it's kind of gone in a kind of roundabout way. Um, but for me, um, looking at the topic of um, education from a feminist perspective, um, and as someone who's a poet and a lover of stories, it is all about stories for me. And it's about learning the stories of women's lives. Um, and recently, um, I've been uh, doing my own genealogy. And I've been learning a lot about the women, um, my women, female ancestors. And the sad thing is, I don't really know their stories because they've been dead for a long time, you know, and unfortunately we couldn't record things like we do now. And um, I'm finding that a lot of them were illiterate. Um, so there's not necessarily those stories that come, you know, that I can, uh, you know, I don't know them at all now, so I can only really imagine them. So I found out about my great, great granny and my great, great, great granny 
And uh, they came from the same place where I come from in Irvine. We've not moved around much in the past few hundred years. I've moved to Glasgow. My brother's moved to Dubai. But <laughs> in general, we've not moved around much. I wrote this poem for them. Actually, I wrote it for um, my Open University course. And I really liked it. And that was one of the poems that I performed at the... Um, slam championships so it seemed to work okay um, so it's uh, it's about these two women and I imagined them at Irvine Beach looking out to the Isles of Craig because that's something that I would do um, that I still do and I did as a kid so I wrote a poem for them and it's about the story stain for my ancestors Catherine Samson Duncan McGinley and her mum Margaret Duncan Wright and their lost stories that I can only imagine. Cathy, Irvine Beach, 1892. I passed the stain from horn to horn, my fingers numb thrown, I ache to know the sea that shaped it. Where my een its cloudy blue grey, my body is hardy, my curves is run. I pit it to my lug as if it was a shell, to hear a sea story, it nothing to tell. And o'er the waves and wind, Paddy's mile staying grinned as if he knew a hundred tales for here to wherever. I asked my mother, Do you think this yin would make a good chucky stain? Do you think I could throw it for here to the ills of Craig? Do you think if the waves would break, they'd bring it back home? Do you think Paddy would keep it as yin his ain? My mother had a tongue that would sour the milk, but the salt sea air softened her words, sharp edges. She said, My dear wee wain. Yon island is made of the stain that drap for the Calius giant horns. It glistens like grains of sawn, glimmers like moonbeams in the ocean. And we're into the horizon, she tell me tales of witches, selkies and wandering whales, how fairies broke loose did Scottish sills back to the shores of her borning. I turned the taze from the water, past the stain to my mother, whinged at my feet, nipped with my tough shin. She says, lift your drook at skirt so the water doesn't get in. Then she tied my scarf, nip it about my chin and said, you can't write to be a stain, but remembers all the stories it's told. And she clasped the stain pearl into my clam-shaped horns and said, you keep it, Cathy, you can pass it on. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, coming from Ayrshire, um, I was obviously kind of raised in Burns, if you come from Ayrshire, and Burns' poetry. And I'm quite ashamed to say that I just found out about this woman very recently, um, t um, Isabel Pagan, she was also known as Tibby. And she was one of Burns' contemporaries, and she lived in Muirkirk, and um, she had a wee house that she would people would come round and get some drink from her, she would sell drink. But she was also a great oral storyteller of poetry and of songs. And um, my favourite, one of my favourite songs of Robert Burns is actually hers. Or, you know, it's, it should be credited to hers because she was the one that kind of passed it on. And it was called The Yows. And um, so I did a wee bit of research on her. So this is a wee bit about me learning about other women. And uh, I read one of her poems and it was actually... It came across as quite sad because she was talking about how Burns and Ramsey, the poets, were now dead and how they seemed to have a better education with her, so that means that they, their poetry might be that wee bit more sophisticated. That was the kind of vibe I was getting from it. And I thought, do you know something? That woman, in terms of her creative process, learned these poems and songs by heart without having what we've got now to write it down and, you know, all our rhyme kind of... Um, rhyming schemes and um, you know you can get your rhymers on the internet and stuff like that she didn't have any of that she would probably have to learn it and then what she did she would ask the weaver to scribe it for her and she would sell them she made money as a poet which is amazing you know she made a living out of it um, selling her poems uh, to the the gentry who came for the hunts in your kirk and would drink in her house um, and I've got a lot of admiration and respect for her um, I would like to read her poem first of all, because um, I've written a poem in response to that. So her poem's called On Burns and Ramsay. Now Burns and Ramsay both are deed, although I cannot them succeed. Yet here I'll try my natural skill and hope you will not take it ill. 
You know their learning was not small, and mine's is next to nane at all. Theirs must be brighter far than mine, because I'm much on the decline. I hope the public will excuse what I have done here by the muse, as if different men are of different minds, my meter is of different kinds. And then I wrote a response to that. Um, and it's called On Isabel Tibby Pagan. At school, I was taught to learn the best of verse that came from men. I should have been taught all along that Ka the Yows was Tibby's song. I wonder what it would be like if she had learned to read and write, meet, meet with her muses at her will to hone her talent and her skill. If she had the chance of earning Burns on Ramsey's education, if their platform was provided, if her passion was encouraged, could she have been our nation's bard, her posy held in high regard? Her history has taught me something to keep supporting gifted women for different ways and different times have hidden some bright female minds. Thank you. Uh, um, my last poem is one that I wrote a wee while ago, um, in fact a good wee while ago when the kids were at primary school and I wrote it um, after a really horrible morning taking them the school run and you know it was one of those mornings where a school trainer was lost and they dug a day at somebody's porridge and there was toothpaste all over somebody's jumper it was just and I actually went to school with my big coat over my jammies it was just a nightmare um, and what I found is that when I went to the school gates I'd look at the other women and think they've got their life together you know why can I not do this um, and I come home and I wrote about you know this fictional woman who could do everything. And I, what I actually realised and learned from my poem is that I was giving myself unhelpful um, stereotypes in terms of what I thought that I should be doing, that, you know, I should be able to have a job and, you know, get the kids to school and, you know, have a perfect house and all the rest of it. And some of them are real stereotypes that not necessarily should be my problem. Um, but so I wrote this, this poem about this fictional woman. Hair, neat, immaculate, petite, she's wearing running gear. Trainers of the designer kind with a pink flash on the side. Every spare time she can find is spent training for a triathlon, her bottom in perfect proportion to breast, waist and hips. Even though she's had three kids, she is the queen of modern suburbia. She has left a car at home, it's a posh one, otherwise known as a Chelsea tractor. Inside it has no trace of crumbs or pastry flakes and smells of magic tree and vanilla and cinnamon. She's been up since 6am, walked the dog, checked her emails, went to the gym and still managed to fit in homemade baking of gluten-free cupcakes and making organic packed lunches. She is the queen of modern suburbia. She has been up all night breastfeeding a baby who is colic and writing a business proposal. She's very professional. <laughs> High flyer in the city with a huge salary. She's very important. Still gets the kids to school by nine and finds the time to chat about her day. She's a smile for everyone she meets. She's a fundraiser on the PTA and a brownie leader. She is the queen of modern suburbia. And at the school gate, she kisses her perfect kids and wipes the lipstick stain from their cheeks and tells them she loves them. Her home is tidy and dust-free, walls a modern shade called urban prosperity. It's clutter-free and feng shui. She is the queen of modern suburbia. At the office, she meets the new hire. She's young, ambitious, upwardly mobile. The business speak at the photocopier, chat about the weather, moan about the pace of HR. And in between the chat of a SWOT analysis not being rocket science, she finds a ladder in her tights and she ponders, is she really doing enough? Will her kids grow up thinking she's been a good mother and how every other woman that she meets seems in control and complete and better than her. These are the daily frustrations. These are the unrealistic expectations to be a woman in modern suburbia. Thank you. <laughs> I think for me it's about valuing what we think education is because it's many things. It's not always this structural thing through academia or even um, 
school education as we know it. And I think I've been very privileged and I never realised, I mean, I left school with very little qualifications and I would call myself an autodidact. You know, I learned experiential and I've been very lucky that I've managed to carve something out in my life as that kind of person. You know, I'm in an academic situation now, it's setting right now, and while I'm learning a lot of great stuff from very learned people, you know, very academic people, I would say they're learning just as much from me. Mm -hmm. And so I value my knowledge and experience as a non-academic as much as theirs is valued. And I think we need to get to a place like that in society. Totally. And I think staying curious is a is a lifelong goal, isn't it? We have to keep sorry asking questions of each other. Question everything and listen to the answer rather than preparing your answer while you're listening. Just listen to understand. There's nothing to be ashamed about by not knowing something. I spend like most of my working day, you know, being asked questions and being like, I, I don't know, mm -hmm. but I, I'll go and find out and then learning about the thing and then feeding it back, you know, and there's a kind of bravery in saying like, I don't know something. And then some people might be interested to find out. Some people might not be. It doesn't really matter. But I think having the courage to just say, you know what? I don't know. Everything is, you know, a way to make people curious as well. That was the wonderful Angie Strachan, followed by our discussion group. And I love the fact that our discussion group went back to curiosity. Staying curious feels like a real kind of, what's the word, like a real message from this episode. And I really think that Angie's work just seems to have curiosity really at the heart of it, whether that's about the Queen of Suburbia or whether it's about her female ancestors. So yeah, thank you, Angie, for just a glorious set. So in a moment, I am going to welcome back Emma Pollock, but I think Caitlin might have a little news first that she wants to share. Hot news! Yes, I do. So although sadly this is our last full episode in the current season of Christcast, we are working on a special bonus episode for you. Um, so we're going to be recording it in August as part of the Edinburgh International Book Festival and we're part of their late night sessions. Um, I don't totally know what that means, but I, it sounds exciting. Um, and we're going to bring back some of our guests from across this season to discuss some of the themes and get into some of a, a bit of a debate. Um, so if you've been uh, enjoying listening to us online, you can come and see us in real life, live and in person, if you're in Edinburgh in August. Um, you can get tickets via the Edinburgh International Book Festival website. Um, and if you're not able to join us in person, that episode will be out in, I think, September-ish. So although this is our last episode, um, you won't be bereft of Quine's cast for too long. Yeah, absolutely. This is our end of term episode, but we are bringing you back for a summer school. Um, I think we all need it. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, Caitlin, for just such a wonderful season. It's been an absolute pleasure to co-host with you. Well, thank you so much, Hannah. And yeah, I agree. Like, I feel like I've been fully nourished by all the different people we've had involved and getting to host it with you. It's been an absolute delight, mate. So hopefully we get to be back soon for a season three. Yeah, it's been an absolute education. It really has. So I did there. Very good. I think before I say anything else, I think this is a perfect moment to introduce the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful Emma Pollitt. It's right about now I should take off my shoes And run into the sea as my skin turns to blue Begging the night to take hold Begging the night to take hold Of her up its anaesthetic Begging the night to take hold Dive into its black magnetic Four girls and their chit-chat Four girls are swapping this and that Four girls they imagine What good, good was doing that What good could come, could come from that 
take off my shoes and run into the sea as my skin turns to blue. Back in the night to take hold. I meet her at the hilltop, but I hear before I see. Her call sounds like the forest, so I cower as I near. But she says hello, Ooh, as the dusk reveals a friendly soul, and just as quickly removes her. What good was doing that? What good? Take off my shoes and run into the sea as my skin turns to blue. Back in the night to take hold. Right about now, I should take off my shoes and run into the sea as my skin turns to blue. But I stand and stare at this laced up footwear and I ask you to tell me what is it out there? Oh, that entrances something that dances. What is it that lingers, that points a finger? Oh, that entrances something that dances. It's right about now I should take off my shoes and run into the sea as my skin Thank you. This next song is, is the last tune I'm going to play. Um, and it's called Pages of a Magazine. When, when I was growing up with my ever-moving parents, it was just... I don't have any siblings. It, it, was, it was just the three of us. And my mum was... Um, she always wanted to get away from Galloway because she was a Glasgow born and bred girl and she absolutely missed the city so badly living in a rural part of Scotland. She just wanted to get back. But she couldn't really do that. So what, what she did was in the summertime, she would buy the Lady magazine. Do you know the Lady magazine? <laughs> and she would, uh, she would get a job working for a big house somewhere. She would be a cook or she would look after the children, or she would she would do things like that. I, I, I watched Downton Abbey recently, and I thought, ah, oh, this is quite familiar. Um, <laughs> my mum was definitely living in the, the servants' quarters a lot at the time and was towing me along. But um, I, I, did, I did go and stay in, in some remarkable places. Um, and again, the travel thing, and I wrote the song, uh, Pages of a Magazine, about it. I'm sitting down to write you a letter And yet I know It's one that you will never read I'm hoping this might Make us feel better Putting words in order Another fault line Explosive prognosis The dawn dodge The motion was a crutch to us Another house Acquainted and tainted As long as she's not still Still the pages of a magazine They gave us life We never see What did you think you were doing down there? How long did you think we'd last on our own alone down there? What did you think? myself in this brand new thrill too young to quite realize we were running from your own 
open page and my obligation steals away and buses riding through the night no matter how loud my agitation the summer was your saving grace you dropped it all without hesitation dream homes nothing more than bricks to me i count them all but i don't have the digits as long as she's not standing still the pages of a magazine they gave us life we'd never seen what did you think you were doing down there how long did you think we'd last on our own alone down there what did you think myself in this brand new thrill too young to quite realize that we were running from standing still i wake and open my eyes lose myself in this brand new thrill too young to quite realize that we were running from your own your own fear Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed our show. If you did, please tell your pals, like, subscribe, and maybe write us a review. It really helps others to find us. This is our last full episode in the current series, but we will be back with our bonus episode in a few weeks' time. Hope you can join us then. This episode of Quine's Cast is created and presented by Hannah Lavery and Caitlin Skinner, featuring original work by our contributors, Al McDermott, Andy Strachan, Nellie Kelly and Emma Pollock. Performers in Little Autistic Girl, Young Autistic Women were Nellie Kelly and Brooke Walker. Our editor was Helena Rafai, our project producer was Barbara Lyon and our sound engineer was David Kay. Stella Quine's team are General Manager Barbie Lyon, Associate Director of Engagement Beth Godfrey, Artistic Director and CEO Caitlin Skinner, company administrator and Young Queens producer Erin McGee. Wines Cast Image is by Julia Francis Dugan. Wines Cast is possible because of funding from Creative Scotland and support from our partners, the Travis Theatre, and from our supporters, the Quine Collective. Stellar Quines is an intersectional feminist theatre company based in Edinburgh. This year, we are celebrating 30 years of keeping the fight for gender equality centre stage. It's a tough time for the arts at the moment, and we really need your help. We've set up our new supporter scheme, the Quines Collective, and we're looking for new members. If you're a supporter of the arts, of feminism, and if you believe the arts has a role to play in the fight for gender justice in Scotland and beyond, then we would love for you to be a part of Quines Collective. You can choose how much you donate, or if you can't contribute financially, you could offer your time or maybe just your good wishes. It all really helps us. You get special updates, a badge, you get to be part of a very cool gang of folk. The money the collective raises helps us to keep delivering for the audiences, artists and communities that we serve and we are so very, very grateful for their support. You can find out more on our website at stellarquines.co.uk. Stellar